serve as our dis distinguished lecturer for this year's Crow Lecture and give us the <laughs> talk here. Professor Fang was born in China, uh, brought up in Philippines. Well, you know, he lived there for 10 years and then went to the U.S. Uh, for college education. He received his PhD in physics from MIT in 1953, then postdoc uh, in an advanced uh, institute for advanced study for two years. Okay, then joined the MIT faculty. Now, current, currently he is a professor emeritus at MIT, he, and he is also a fellow of the prestigious American Academy of Arts and Science. Professor Fang is famous for his work on both Einstein condensation, quantum field theory, and protein folding. He has uh, worked on the theory of interacting boson, boson, especially on the phase diagram and the superfluid pinning in the random potential. One of, many, one of his many contributions in field theory include the asymptotically free scalar field in four dimensions, which was generally uh, thought to be impossible. Uh, Professor Fang is also author for, of many well-known textbooks, including uh, Statistics Mechanics, <laughs> okay, now this is uh, the books. Now, I took all these photos from uh, Amazon. Okay, including the uh, uh, quantum statistical mechanics, uh, electron and gauge field, quantum field theory, and etc. Well, in addition to the physics textbook, Professor Huang together uh, uh, also translate E G. Okay. Uh, from Chinese uh, into uh, uh, English, okay? Uh, the transition is a starkly beautiful poetic explanation of the hexagram, said one reviewer. I guess we should not be surprised that the translation is poet poetic, because Professor Fang is not just a physicist, he also a poet. His translation of... Okay. okay. Uh, his, his translation of the uh, Lubayet, okay, of Omar, uh, Omar Kaya from English to Chinese is a classic in itself. Now let me show you a few points, okay, so that you can know how difficult it is to translate a point from a, uh, and from one language to another. Okay, you see that. Uh, <coughs> Lobaya actually is a form of a Persian uh, point. It's a four nine. Okay, so Professor Fang translated it into a you know we know in 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 uh, in Chinese literature as uh, 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 a Okay, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we, we we can see that how the translation uh, was beautifully done, prof Professor Fang at age. 20 plus. That's when he was a graduate student working for his PhD. Uh, and uh, in addition to translating a uh, uh, point, he is he also write uh, uh, a point himself. Okay. The next one is a collection of uh, his work, Chang uh, Ji. Okay. So let me quote from the press release of Professor Fang's book. The highest aspiration of science and literature is of the same origin and is consistent. They differ only in the way and the technique they were presented. Okay, with this, uh, let's welcome Professor Huang.
高兴今天有机会跟大家讨论。今天谈的是宇宙。Ex <coughs> cosmos。啊，我是可以是看这个是吧？看这个是吧 ？OK。啊，我 We know that the 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 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded last week on the for the discovery of the Higgs particle. It's um, after decades of search, the Higgs particle was discovered at CERN. In a reaction like this one, in a detector like the one shown at the bottom, it's very it's, it's a person. And um, Higgs and Andrea got a Nobel Prize for introducing the underlying field which implied that there might be such a particle. Uh, what I want to talk about today is the implication of this underlying field on cosmology. The Higgs field is a field. It's field it fills the vacuum. And on a microscopic scale, that's what it's used for, it gives mass to elementary particles, namely W to Z and quarks. And particle physicists don't think about what happens to this on a macroscopic scale, just like on a scale this big. On a macro scale, it flows like a superfluid. That's because it has a phase, it's a complex field. And the phase variation represents superfluid flow. We'll come to that a little bit later. And on a cosmic scale, it makes the entire universe a superfluid. The great puzzles of all time dark energy and dark matter. And the theme of this talk is that the, the Higgs explains this all. Dark energy is the energy of Higgs superfluid, and dark matter is the density variation of the Higgs superfluid. So with the Higgs from the, all, all the universe as superfluid, they explain all these things. That's the theme of this talk. We have to first talk about some background of dark energy. A long time ago, Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding. But it, he observed that the galaxies are moving away from each other. The farther apart us they are, the faster they are moving from each other. It is like as if they were on the surface of a balloon and something is blowing up the balloon. And when this blows up, every point goes away from every other point at a speed that's proportional to the distance between those points. That's called the expanding universe. The, the fabric of the universe is expanding. And Hubble's law says that the expansion is a uh, the velocity is proportional to the distance between these galaxies. And that's, that was so for a long time. Until recently. Here's a plot. People have measured the distance of a galaxy from us, and here's the velocity of, of, of recession from us. And Hubble's law was said as a straight line, proportional. And these are the earlier observations for the closer galaxies. But recent observations were the further Father of the they deviate from this curve. This is, a, this, this is a definite deviation. And this shows that the galaxies, the farther galaxies away from are actually accelerating. That means the expansion of the universe does not proceed at a constant rate, but it's accelerating. Whoever is blowing up a balloon does it at an accelerated rate. And then people say that this is very, this must be due to some unknown energy. And they call it dark energy. Dark energy is the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. This is very surprising because people would think that as time goes on, the universe would get tired and would slow down. But not it accelerates. And there's also this, this mystery of the dark matter. Here's a galaxy rotates. And you can measure the velocity of the particle, the dust around the galaxy. And the velocity, when it, when, when it, when it measures, it, it looks like this. But the velocity is made a very high velocity up to very far from the galaxy. But if you look at the galaxy mass, according to what this mass can sustain, it should follow a curve like this, it should drop off, but it doesn't. And so people say that this distance must be made up because there's some dark matter surrounding the galaxy that we cannot see. 
Change this cutoff, this field undergoes so called renormalization. So it's all the parameters in the field must change so as to preserve the identity of the field. And that's this renormalization effect happens only in quantum fields, it does not happen in a particle field. Renormalization, this is an important phenomenon for quantum fields, was discovered by Dyson a long time ago in the uh, 70s in quantum molecular dynamics. It was later extended by Wilson into something physical. And Wilson had a Nobel Prize for this work. 
It is, in short, it is, as the scale changes, one must adjust the coupling in the theory so as to preserve the identity of the theory. And the system's appearance then changes, but its identity is preserved. I can, if this is a momentum spectrum of the theory, you can say that when we define a theory, we cut it off here. We ignore everything here because at high momentum, the theory cannot really describe what you're interested in. So you cut it off here. There's a cutoff down to zero. But when, when, you, when you work at a phenomenon, the phenomenon exists at a much lower momentum, so you lower the cutoff. You lower it by not this lowering these away, but you hide them. You hide them by adjusting the constants of the theory to uh, give the theory a different appearance, but actually the identity of the theory does not change. And this is very common in every lab, actually. If you look at the, see, if I look at this picture, if you look at this at our scale, you say, oh, that, that's Dyson. But if you use a microscope to look at it, you just see pigment. You don't see Dyson, you see pigment. You look further, you see atoms and so forth. But it's the same picture, the same object. It's just the scale at which you examine it is different. <coughs> and we know that it just expresses this fact in a mathematical term. A scalar field has a Lagrangian that looks like this kinetic energy minus a potential term. And the potential could be uh, some function of phi, which Usually it's expanded power to try. And the equation of motion is, is this, uh, I want to call this a nonlinear Klein Gordon equation. This is a high, there's a high cutoff, that is, all the modes beyond a certain momentum will be thrown out. That's, that's the cutoff. The length scale is one of the lambda. And we don't say it makes the coupling of these lambdas dependent on the length scale. And therefore, this potential. This dependence is especially important when the scale changes rapidly as to the Big Bang, which produces this. Because the whole point of Big Bang is the scale change. It explodes. And if you want to consider quantum fields and you're doing a Big Bang, you had better know how it behaves under scale transformation. So here's the, the scale of transforming from a group, and it's called the renormalization group. Here is that, as he, his the state of all possible theory, so he says, all possible Lagrangians. As you change the scale, the Lagrangian changes, because the potential changes. So the theory traces out a trajectory in this case, as scale changes. And there are fixed points in this thing, representing systems that are scale invariant. And these trajectories end in fixed points, and it goes into fixed points. And so these are trajectories of systems that the system follows when the scale changes. In other words, when you go from point to point on this scale in the space of Lagrangian, the, the appearance of the system changes. It looks different. But the basic identity is the same. And um, a trajectory that goes out from this point <coughs> to its uh, longer and longer length scale is called ultraviolet, because in the opposite direction it goes to high energy. The other thing is called uh, infrared. The infrared trajectory is sort of special. It's, I'm not going to go into this, but the infrared trajectory is it's, 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 a, it's, it's a line of phase transition. But I just want to give you the general idea that this is how uh, one can navigate the whole space of all possible advantages by changing the scale. So the appearance of, this, of the system changes. And then there are fixed points at which the system does not change the scale transformation. So let's, look, let's think about something big like the creation. What happens at the creation? Big Bang. At the Big Bang, the scale must be zero. The universe has zero radius. So the momentum is infinite. There was no interaction. The universe is a, is a Gaussian fixed point. At this point, you have a Gaussian field that is a free, massless field. And creation means that somebody throws this system out in infinitesimal, displaces it from the fixed point. This Gaussian um, fixed point represents a massless scale invariant theory 
and you put the system there, it never changes on the scale of something like this. During the Big Bang, somehow it was slightly displaced from this point, infinitesimal. Then it developed. But that's the development of the Big Bang. And it could go out on this along a trajectory. If this is an, and, and, and along this trajectory, it would represent an asymptotically free system. Or it could go out on one of these dotted lines, then it'll go, go back right again. Along these dotted lines, it, is a, it has never left the point. So that uh, you might say that the Big Bang is a, in this point of view, somebody at random throws, throws out the universe to some, to some direction. Some of them would develop useful universes, and others would material will go back. And we happen to be along one of those lucky ones. Now, if it goes out along one of the ones, then the, then the potential of the scalar field must be asymptotically free. That is, it must vanish at high energy. And that puts a very stringent condition on the potential that you can use. The only potential that's asymptotically free is the halpern hahn potential, which Halpern and I discovered in 1995. That was Halpern's PhD thesis, actually. That's the only one. All the others, five, four, five, six, they are all non-free. And it is a it is a Kuma function, which is a hybrid geometry function. And it looks like this. It looks uh, like the ordinary potential, except that at very high fields, it behaves exponentially. And the only freedom in the choice of this are the are certain parameters in a Kuma function and the coefficient. And therefore, this is the only potential you can use to describe the Big Bang. So now we can write that cosmological equation. I don't want to go into this too detail. I just want to give you a general idea. This is Einstein's equation. This is the, the curvature part. And this T mu nu is the matter which generates curvature. And G is the Newton's constant. Normally, in many discussions, one just takes this, one doesn't, know what, one doesn't know what to do with the T mu nu, one just assumes a certain thing. In our theory, T mu nu is dynamical. It comes from this equation. So it's a closed system, soft system, closed system. The scalar field generates the T mu nu, the, the T mu nu generates the curvature, and the curvature influences the Klein border equations by changing this delta, and so forth. And uh, this is just technical. I don't want to use the Robert and Walker metric. The gravity scale is A, the radius of the universe, and the scalar field has a scale lambda. Since there's only one scale in the universe, lambda must be equal to 1 over A. And this H bar, because of dimension, so this is quantum mechanics. But it doesn't say there's a dynamical feedback. The gravity provides the cutoff to the scalar field, which generates the gravitational field, which cuts off the scalar field, and so forth. So this is a feedback, and the two are dynamically coupled together. So now, you can write down an initial value, a mathematical initial value problem to describe the Big Bang. Uh, these two equations have to do with gravity, and this, this equation has to do with the scalar field, and this is a constraint equation, known to those who are known as Friedman's equation. It constrains the data to some initial subspace, and the reservation must respect this constraint must make x dot equal to zero. To make that happen, because our color here, we have to add this term. We just add this term because <coughs> that's necessary to make x dot equal to zero, but it turns out that this is the so-called trace anomaly in quantum field theory, which I'll mention what to do. So, to summarize, we cannot go exactly to the Big Bang, because if you uh, look at the constraint, there's a one over a, you cannot go to a equal to zero. You have to avoid that a little bit. So we start the model somewhat after the Big Bang, say at 10 to the, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And we start here. We say that there's already a superfluid here, and we watch how it develops according to the Einstein equation. Uh, the universe could have been created in a hot normal phase here. There could have been, maybe there was no superfluid here, but then it will cool down during this interval, and we already have a superfluid. So we started, and that's our assumption. We started with the superfluid. Here's the numerical solution. 
the whole thing could be solved in MATLAB. In fact, this is solved in MATLAB. The, uh, the result is that this um, radius relief was ex increased exponentially, but not like a time, but time to some fractional power. I mean, like P is a some number between 1 and 0, which is a parameter of the theory. And since A accelerates, we have dark energy. And since the um, power is 1 minus theta, it's just P so that the effective Hubble constant decays in time, and that solves the so-called fine-tuning problem, for those who know. And here's some of the history. Here's the, the, the radius usually increases like this, and the field fire also is like this. So this uh, gives you a picture of how the universe expands, how it in an accelerated way, and therefore supplies dark energy. The question is, does this uh, agree with experiment? So we uh, plot the uh, data again. Here's the redshift parameter, which is just velocity. Here, instead of covering distance, we plot distance divided by z. Because in this way, Hubble's law is, is, a, is a horizontal line. Anything that lies above the line means that there's dark energy. And the data is a black thing and a white thing. The, the black thing is from supernova, which is more reliable, and the white circles are gamma ray bursts, which are not as reliable. And our theory predicts a curve that looks like this. And if you adjust the probability, this curve only moves up and down. It cannot change shape. So it looks like we can fit this part with curve A. But the data seems to go to another curve B. So this suggests that if you go this way, you'll go into the path. So it looks like that somewhere in the path, there's a transition, a phase from one phase to another phase, and then the universe. But this is, of course, very crude because the data is not quite reliable. And if you take this seriously, this happened about 7 billion years ago. But anyway, the point is that it fits this uh, reliable data at uh, smaller redshift. And therefore, it's, uh, at least it is not ruled out by the data so far. But there are other problems which need a generalization into a complex scalar field. What I'll talk about was just a sim simple calculation of the real scalar field. We don't need a complex scalar field. So there's new physics. The new physics is superfluidity and quantum turbulence. You see, if you have a real scalar field, you do not have superfluidity. If you don't have a phase, you need a phase. So now we need superfluidity and quantum turbulence in order to explain two things. One is how matter was created. Matter, we must create enough matter for subsequent nucleogenesis before the universe gets too large. Because now the matter is very uniform over the whole universe. So the idea was that matter was all created when the universe was very small, smaller than a P. So that it was very uniform, and now, and then after that, no more creation. And so now the matter remembers the density from those times. So you have to create matter. And with a real scalar field, we cannot think of anything that would do it efficiently. Second, this is decoupling. This is somewhat technical. The matter is actually governed by the nuclear scale of 1 GeV. That's, that's, that's QCD scale. But equations have a built-in time scale of 10 to the 18 GeV. These two must decouple from each other. How does this happen? This is also but we can solve both problems by using complex scalar field, by introducing this new physics. So now we have to explain what this new physics is. In a scalar field, and so one of the most remarkable things is quantized vorticity. And it's a vortex involves a vortex line, a core containing a line. And around that line, the integral of the superfluid velocity on the code curve must be equal to 2 pi times an integer. And that's because it comes from a wave function. And this is a quantized vortex. 